Good evening. I hope um, this is recording okay. My apologies if you keep getting reflections from the laptop screen in my specs. I'm recording this on my rather ancient MacBook Pro from about eight to ten years ago. And at the same time, I because it's a middle of lockdown, I can actually have a gin and tonic in my hand as I do it. Uh, and have a little bit of liquid refreshments, as you may say, while I'm in the middle of making this video. This was a challenge I received from Rania Hafez about, oh, just over a week ago, I suppose. I was uh, I mentioned I'd been doing some videos for the WEA, uh, which were limited to my students, and I said that I would... Uh, imitate some of the videos she'd been doing which were about cooking in her fabulous kitchen uh, uh, and thought I would just rehash some of the stuff I've done already for WEA uh, consumption. How about I take my glasses off? That might actually that might actually help a bit then you won't get this constant reflection. If I have to put them on again it means I'm reading something so there's me without glasses. Oh my God. Um, the session I did, a f a, well, it's about two weeks ago now, seems much longer than that during this period of being locked up inside. Uh, the session I did was called The Cyborg Manifesto, and it was around the work of Donna Haraway, who is a... Emeritus Professor of Technology and also um, Feminist Studies and in an eminent, 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 yeah, that's, a, that's the right word, an eminent writer uh, out of California in the USA who is uh, known for this, I mean, she's written an awful lot, but she's known for particular, particularly for this one piece called The Cyborg Manifesto which she originally wrote in 1985, but has been revised in 1991. And in the process of writing it caused a huge degree of controversy throughout uh, the world of feminist studies, really, in some respects, and also with respect to her uh, own reputation as an individual in terms of her critique and her capacity to write, and, and so on and so forth. She really did hit the headlines with this. Consequently, Cyborg Manifesto has become something of a cause célèbre in the world of, of both postmodernism, posthumanism, and feminism, and is seen as quite an extraordinary piece, really, in some respects. And I hadn't come across it until I volunteered for the WBA to do a session on posthumanism uh, and encountered it in doing some research during that process. It proved to be quite illuminating. I was very enthusiastic about it as soon as I came across it. I'm a, I'm a, I mean, you, you know, I'm a, a long time science fiction fan, so that's not surprising. Excuse me, I'm going to have a drink. Uh, but also, interested, interested in the position that individuals have with regard to their own self identity in the new technological world and being someone. It was transgender, as you already know. This process is something which I think is deep, very dear to my heart. So Donna Haraway's work has a lot of comment on that. I don't think she deliberately wrote it around transgender people. But in the process of writing it, she drew attention to some of the issues that transgender people face. Now, can I... For those who are about to rush out and, and get hold of a coffee, cut, cut hold of a coffee? Well, maybe you're going to get hold of a coffee. I'm like, after all, I am drinking. But for those who are about to go out and get hold of a copy, it's not necessarily an easy read. Um, Haraway has a habit of being uh, very postmodern in her approach, which is often synonymous with dense 
But in fact, in this particular case, she is de she deliberately takes on this particular kind of persona, this particular kind of approach, in order to illuminate what she wants to say, rather than and deliberately going out of her way to tell you stuff in the you know, the old fashioned style that philosophers always used to do. You know, when you read a, a philosopher's work, they're constantly telling you things you're supposed to know. Whereas I don't think Har Donna Haraway does that. She's more interested in a descriptive approach or in very very often an ironic approach approach or a sarcastic or or, or, or satirical approach or a very much a a sense of multiple layers of meaning at the same time. So consequently, in, in order to avoid the business of pu purely being didactic, uh, she has a rather more complex way of writing. Uh, but I, I have to say, it is worth approaching. I think it's a very much an important uh, piece of work that, that, that allows people to get some insight if you keep persisting with it. And my persistence with it has paid off in a number of different ways. So I do advise that. It's readily available on the internet if you if you look for uh, a, to do a search. You come across PDF copies from various universities around the world. And uh, it is not immensely long. It's about 80 pages if you get it in PDF format. Uh, um, but I would approach it in multiple, you know, bit by bit reading rather than try to get through the entire lot in one go. So what is it about? Well, it's about cyborgs, cybernetic organisms, as you might say, uh, which sounds something like something directly out of the work of Isaac Asimov. And to a certain extent, it is. Um, Donna says that she is a, a sci-fi fan. She mentions various science fiction authors in, in her work. But that's not all that this is about. If a cybernetic organism is the meeting of technology and biology in the sense of the creation of new chimera style organisms which are not just biological not just technological but a fusion of both then one we need to be careful about the way in which Haraway, Donna Haraway describes and defines the idea of technology itself. She doesn't just mean our modern electronics She's not trying to make us all believe that somehow this is about embedding silicon under the skin, as you might say, uh, in any sense of, of silicon under the skin. Uh, but she means technology in its widest sense, and especially the external technology which has infiltrated into our lives to the extent that it has become almost indispensable to us. And if anybody's been sort of locked down during the current COVID-19 uh, pandemic, you will know exactly how important technology suddenly has become. The very idea of me sitting here making this video is a clear example of that. You know, I wouldn't have dreamt to do this otherwise, and it's, uh, it is something which really has spurred me into action in, in keeping in touch with people in the outside world, rather than just speaking in public and talking to students in, in sessions and so on and so forth. So when, when, when Donna Haraway mentions technology. She meant technology not just in us but around us. And she mentions and means technology which is communicative more than anything else. She thinks of it as something which expands the human concept as an entity. Instead of us just being individuals who are at the mercy of neoliberalism and capitalism, she sees the, the new burgeoning technology as a way of um, expanding outside of those kinds of of restrictions, those restraints, and having affiliations with the rest of the world which are not just purely based upon those which are given to us at the very start of our lives. So she she's interested in not just the fact that we are uh, connected to each other through our families, which you know we, we are kind of thrown into whether we like it or not, or through the people we meet in our school lives or at work or stuff like that. Well, the affiliations which go beyond those sort of processes, which are to do with, with friendships, which are to do with common ground, which are to do with common needs, as you might say, which which we would never have had before because with without the new technology, without the internet, without communication devices, which we've all got, we would never have had those. Uh, I, I, you know, during this process, I've realized how important that has been every single day 
during lockdown, I've understood how very, very vitally important it has been that we have this external capacity to be beyond ourselves, to extend our humanness beyond the business of our physical being as people, and beyond the four walls of our houses, and beyond our limited communities that we may have in terms of physical human contact. And I think this is really what Donna Haraway forecast back in 1985. She was really keen on the idea of taking advantage of this wider world and extending our capacity to work together as allied creatures outside of our normal reach, as you might say, which our biology gave to us at the very start. Our technology does more than that. It creates a reach which is global and in which each of us becomes nodes in a global network, as you might say. We are part and parcel of something which is far wider than us as individuals. To an extent, the internet and its various facilities has given us something like a hive mind. It has given us more than just the individual minds that we have, but the connections between individual minds that extend across the global frontier of science that we are, I suppose, becoming increasingly accommodated to and physically in need of. If you'd asked me 10 or 15 years ago whether this would have ever come into reality, I would have said we, it was complete nonsense. Today, it has become so real that the internet and its facilities have now become the equivalent of having water or electricity in your house. The idea of not having it strikes me as being almost disabling in its, in, it, in its most serious sense. And that is what being a cyborg means to Donna Haraway. It doesn't necessarily mean that suddenly I'll be sprouting mechanical bits out of my face or wherever, <laughs> but I will be seen as some a person who has more than just the innate biological facilities that I have. She also sees it as being about an extension of the biology that we already, we've already got, a reconstruction of the self through the technology that we, we encounter. And for transgender people, that is very, very much the case. Um, anybody who has ever gone through the whole business of transition knows how technological this process can be. We go through the business, for instance, of taking, often taking hormones in order to change our physical shape. We end up wearing things like, as she says, playing with her. This is a wig. We probably guessed as much, but it is a wig. And anybody who knows me very well will know that I change my colour of my hair and my style of my hair almost every day. So you can never really be certain what colour hair I'm going to have. Now, that to a certain extent is an advantage, and, and many individuals have said to me in the past, oh my god, I wish I was like you, be. you can have a different colour hair every day. And, and that, that's because of the technology. The technology of, of, of hair has got to the point where I can be a different person because of that. There is, you know, trans people know about the business of of changing their physical shape. Some people go through the process of, of, of medical intervention, surgery, which change their physical, physical appearance, their genital region, uh, their entire bodily shape, breast implants, and so on and so forth. The transgender person, to a certain extent, if you, if you think of that, those interventions as being technological, then, cyber, then the, 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 the transgender person today is very often the ultimate cyborg of the early 21st century. That's kind of shocking, I suppose. It's probably something that most people would find difficult to take on board. I suppose people who are seeking um, foundations for themselves within the gender spectrum would find it difficult to deal with the uh, ambiguity of technological impact that this all brings to us and find it difficult to know who they are. But I think what Donna Haraway is calling for is an, an encounter with ambiguity, a sense of being at home with ambiguity, and, and not being so in, not so being so much in retreat from it, as you might say. So not knowing who you are is a journey which most of us, I think, in the early 21st century are pursuing. And I think that pursuit is, is a is a worthwhile thing. And we pursue that through our affiliation groups, not necessarily through the standard kinds of social contact of community that we normally think of as community. What else are cyborgs? Cyborgs are scary people. Cyborgs are both 
um, monsters who careen around the social networks causing trouble because of the fact they can careen around the social networks causing trouble. They are in many ways more than themselves and also less than the, the sum of their parts. They are in many ways important to the way in which they challenge society's conceptions of itself. They are part and parcel of a new regeneration of the way in which humanity can develop and the way in which humanity is, is, can embrace the whole business of the new technological frontier. Cyborgs are fearless about technology. They don't see it as, as something bad. They see it as something which will regenerate and recreate the human race in a new and more vital form than, than we've ever had before. Also, Haraway talks quite regularly throughout her work about dichotomies of various types. She talks about the conflicts between us and them, between good and bad, between male and female, between the various kinds of oppositional positions that people take within society that create uh, long-lasting wars, almost eternal, infinite wars of conflict, of oppositional conflict, which are never won because both sides are predicated on the other in order for their very in order for, in order to have a, an existence of their own. So, in in many respects, there is a sense that Haraway wants to transcend these kinds of oppositional positions by looking at this new generation of cyborgians, as you might say, in the in the in the, in the world uh, as a as a global community. She is skeptical in the most profound way about classical feminism, especially classical second wave fem feminism that she encountered when she was first writing. She's in, she is skeptical about it because of the retreat away from modern technological approaches that were very much in vogue at the time when the Cyborg Manifesto was written. Uh, she's very critical of Catherine McKinnon about, especially about the, uh, the idea of the concept of the Earth Goddess, con con the Earth Goddess symbolism that was introduced in those particular periods. I remember it well. There was an awful lot of that sort of uh, uh, approach in education, women's education at the time, which was about getting back to the Earth Mother concept and being part and parcel of a more primitive, almost opting out culture of the time. And um, I know this is controversial. I know this is highly controversial, and and I knew know at the time that. Haraway got a lot of flack for, for what she said. Um, I am somewhat sympathetic to it. I'm somewhat sympathetic to it because at the end of the day, uh, I lack a lot of transgender people. It's difficult for us to feel at home in any kind of political framework that encompasses gender. And we're especially very wary of anything that smells of essentialism, that idea that somehow there is some internal human essence that specifies exactly where you belong within the social structures and and and, and, and natural as naturalistic structures of the world uh, as a trans person I find that difficult I mean I find essentialism really very difficult and it's one of the things that's often thrust at me as a as a critique when I use the term woman in with reference to myself it's often I've often felt that that particular word almost couldn't be something I could use. But for, for, for Donna Haraway, that is a phrase that is something, you know, the idea of being a woman is more than just some basic biological parts. It's about the whole business of something which is far more extensive than that, and which is self-constructive in many respects, and which is about the business of going beyond what is simply the, the basic biological essentialism. She's very hostile to the idea of essentialism, which is one of the reasons why I, I found her, her work really interesting and really stimulating. As a socialist feminist herself, that's the word she uses for herself, she is fascinating to, to read. Highly descriptive, as I said earlier on, and very phenomenological. Her, she describes phenomena more than tries to analyse them. I said earlier on also she was quite she was quite satirical. She's satirical because at the end of the day she's she, her satire is a like it's a little like um, George Orwell's 1984 when 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 
Orwell wrote 1984 back in 1948, um, he was an he wasn't just writing a dystopian horror story about a possible future. He was, to a certain extent, doing that, but he was also, in many ways, doing more than that. He was also parodying the kind of lives and, and systems he was encountering on a day-to-day -day basis back in the, the late 1940s. Do you remember the famous Room 101, which in the, the, in the, in the novel is the uh, room that contains the worst thing in the world, the, the thing that people are more frightened of than anything else? Well, the story goes that, in fact, Room 101 was an actual room in, at uh, Broadcasting House at the BBC, uh, and at the time, Orwell was working for the BBC and had to go to interminable meetings, during which he was <laughs> subject to being bored out of his skull, and the room they held the meetings in was Room 101. So what's this got to do with the Sadborg Manifesto? Well, if Orwell's 1984 is satirical, then so is Cyborg Manifesto. It is an accurate technological and political and feminist tract, but it also has an underlying stream of ironic comedy going all the way through it. It is meant to be taken seriously, but you can read it on multiple levels. And in that respect, I think it's a really remarkable piece of work. That's what makes it exceptionally good, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I'd like to leave the topic there. I hope I've piqued your interest. If you found that interesting, to go and look, go away and have a look at that. I'll put my glasses back on so I can actually see what I'm doing before I shut this system down. And I'll also drink the remainder of my G&T. Thank you. <laughs> um, I did this all in one take. Are you proud of me? I hope you are. Um, I've been teaching for 35 years and I know how to improvise. Or, uh, oh, let me put it another way, I know how to gab on for ages and uh, keep things running. <laughs> So I hope you found this fascinating. I hope you found it really interesting. I will tart it up a little bit now and um, put it up on YouTube and place a link on Facebook for everybody to have a, a, a read of it. And I'll also try to add some links to um, the original work by Donna Haraway, um, which you might like to download and read. Thank you very much for watching. I hope it wasn't too boring. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.